Anxiety might be alleviated by regulating gut bacteria People who experience anxiety symptoms might be helped by taking steps to regulate the microorganisms in their gut using probiotic and non-probiotic food and supplements, suggests a review of studies published today in the journal General Psychiatry. Anxiety symptoms are common in people with mental diseases and a variety of physical disorders, especially in disorders that are related to stress. Previous studies have shown that as many as a third of people will be affected by anxiety symptoms during their lifetime. Increasingly, research has indicated that gut microbiota, the trillions of microorganisms in the gut which perform important functions in the immune system and metabolism by providing essential inflammatory mediators, nutrients and vitamins, can help regulate brain function through something called the gut-brain axis. Recent research also suggests that mental disorders could be treated by regulating the intestinal microbiota, but there is no specific evidence to support this. Therefore a team of researchers from the Shanghai Mental Health Center at Shanghai Jiao Tong University School of Medicine, set out to investigate if there was evidence to support improvement of anxiety symptoms by regulating intestinal microbiota. They reviewed 21 studies that had looked at 1,503 people collectively. Of the 21 studies, 14 had chosen probiotics as interventions to regulate intestinal microbiota IRIFs, and 7 chose non-probiotic ways, such as adjusting daily diets. Probiotics are living organisms found naturally in some foods that are also known as good or friendly bacteria because they fight against harmful bacteria and prevent them from settling in the gut. The researchers found that probiotic supplements in seven studies within their analysis contained only one kind of probiotic, two studies used a product that contained two kinds of probiotics, and the supplements used in the other five studies included at least three kinds. Overall, 11 of the 21 studies showed a positive effect on anxiety symptoms by regulating intestinal microbiota, meaning that more than half 52% of the studies showed this approach to be effective, although some studies that had used this approach did not find it worked. Of the 14 studies that had used probiotics as the intervention, more than a third 36%, found them to be effective in reducing anxiety symptoms, while six of the remaining seven studies that had used non-probiotics as interventions found those to be effective, a 86% rate of effectiveness. Some studies had used both the IRIF interventions to regulate intestinal microbiota approach and treatment as usual. In the five studies that used treatment as usual and IRIF as interventions, only studies that had conducted non-probiotic ways got positive results, that showed a reduction in anxiety symptoms. Non-probiotic interventions were also more effective in the studies that used IRIF alone. In those studies only using IRIF, 80% were effective when using non-probiotic interventions, while only 45% were found to be effective when using probiotic ways. The authors say one reason that non-probiotic interventions were significantly more effective than probiotic interventions was possible due to the fact that changing diet, a diverse energy source, could have more of an impact on gut bacteria growth than introducing specific types of bacteria in a probiotic supplement. Also, because some studies had involved introducing different types of probiotics, these could have fought against each other to work effectively, and many of the intervention times used might have been too short to significantly increase the abundance of the imported bacteria. Most of the studies did not report serious adverse events, and only four studies reported mild adverse effects such as dry mouth and diarrhea. This is an observational study, and as such, cannot establish cause. Indeed, the authors acknowledge some limitations, such as differences in study design, subjects, interventions and measurements, making the data unsuitable for further analysis. Nevertheless, they say the overall quality of the 21 studies included was high. The researchers conclude, we find that more than half of the studies included showed it was positive to treat anxiety symptoms by regulation of intestinal microbiota. There are two kinds of interventions, probiotic and non-probiotic interventions, to regulate intestinal microbiota, and it should be highlighted that the non-probiotic interventions were more effective than the probiotic interventions. More studies are needed to clarify this conclusion since we still cannot run meta-analysis so far. They also suggest that, in addition to the use of psychiatric drugs for treatment, we can also consider regulating intestinal flora to alleviate anxiety symptoms.
Fettuccine may be most obvious sign of life on Mars, researchers report a rover scanning the surface of Mars for evidence of life might want to check for rocks that look like pasta, researchers report in the journal Astrobiology. The bacterium that controls the formation of such rocks on Earth is ancient and thrives in harsh environments that are similar to conditions on Mars, said University of Illinois geology professor Bruce Falk, who led the new, NASA-funded study. It has an unusual name, Sulfur Hydrogenibium Yellowstonense, he said. We just call it, Sulfury. The bacterium belongs to a lineage that evolved prior to the oxygenation of Earth roughly 2.35 billion years ago, Falk said. It can survive in extremely hot, fast-flowing water bubbling up from underground hot springs. It can withstand exposure to ultraviolet light and survives only in environments with extremely low oxygen levels, using sulfur and carbon dioxide as energy sources. Taken together, these traits make it a prime candidate for colonizing Mars and other planets, Falk said. And because it catalyzes the formation of crystalline rock formations that look like layers of pasta, it would be a relatively easy life form to detect on other planets, he said. The unique shape and structure of rocks associated with sulfury result from its unusual lifestyle, Falk said. In fast-flowing water, sulfury bacteria latch on to one another and hang on for dear life, he said. They form tightly wound cables that wave like a flag that is fixed on one end, he said. The waving cables keep other microbes from attaching. Sulfury also defends itself by oozing a slippery mucus. These sulfury cables look amazingly like fettuccine pasta, while further downstream they look more like capellini pasta, Falk said. The researchers used sterilized pasta forks to collect their samples from Mammoth Hot Springs in Yellowstone National Park. The team analyzed the microbial genomes, evaluated which genes were being actively translated into proteins and deciphered the organism's metabolic needs, Falk said. The team also looked at sulfury's rock-building capabilities, finding that proteins on the bacterial surface speed up the rate at which calcium carbonate, also called travertine, crystallizes in and around the cables, one billion times faster than in any other natural environment on Earth, Falk said. The result is the deposition of broad swaths of hardened rock with an undulating, filamentous texture. This should be an easy form of fossilized life for a rover to detect on other planets, Falk said. If we see the deposition of this kind of extensive filamentous rock on other planets, we would know it's a fingerprint of life, Falk said. It's big and it's unique. No other rocks look like this. It would be definitive evidence of the presences of alien microbes. Falk also is an affiliate professor of microbiology and of the Carl R. Woese Institute for Genomic Biology at the U of I. Godzilla is back and he's bigger than ever. The evolutionary biology of the monster Godzilla first made his debut in 1954. At inception, he was a 50-meter tall metaphor for indiscriminate destruction, particularly U.S. hydrogen bomb testing in the Marshall Islands, which, in the film, destroyed Godzilla's deep-sea ecosystem. 65 years and 35 films later, Godzilla is back and bigger than ever in Godzilla, King of the Monsters. At 119.8 meters tall, Godzilla battles it out for supremacy against three god-sized monsters, all with the future of humanity at stake. Film critics and fans have long observed that Godzilla has been getting larger over time, as buildings become taller. In fact, Godzilla has evolved 30 times faster than other organisms on Earth, according to a team of Dartmouth scientists whose findings are published in Science. The researchers propose that Godzilla has been evolving in response to a spike in humanity's collective anxiety. They used U.S. military spending as a proxy for our collective anxiety and found a strong correlation between it and Godzilla's body size between 1954 and 2019. If Godzilla is the embodiment of our anxiety, they argued, then our collective anxiety appears to be spiking as it did during the nuclear age of the 1950s. If one accepts that Godzilla is a ceratosaurid dinosaur from the Jurassic period, as argued in the film series, then he represents a sensational example of evolutionary stability over a span of at least 145 million years. Yet Godzilla has doubled in size since 1954, far surpassing the rate of evolution observed in 2,500 natural organisms today. 
Godzilla's body was consistent for some 150 million years until 1954, suggesting a sudden and strong selective pressure on body size during the past 65 years, says co-author Nathaniel J. Demini, the Charles Hansen Professor of Anthropology and a professor of the Ecology, Evolution, Ecosystems and Society graduate program at Dartmouth. Demini co-authored the study with Ryan Kalsbeek, an associate professor of biological sciences and of the ecology, evolution, ecosystems and society graduate program at Dartmouth. The co-authors add that Godzilla endures as a cultural icon because it is a fable with a lesson for our times. Comet inspires chemistry for making breathable oxygen on Mars science fiction stories are chock full of terraforming schemes and oxygen generators for a very good reason, we humans need molecular oxygen O2, to breathe, and space is essentially devoid of it. Even on other planets with thick atmospheres, O2 is hard to come by. So, when we explore space, we need to bring our own oxygen supply. That is not ideal because a lot of energy is needed to hoist things into space atop a rocket, and once the supply runs out, it is gone. One place molecular oxygen does appear outside of Earth is in the wisps of gas streaming off comets. The source of that oxygen remained a mystery until two years ago when Konstantinos P. Giapis, a professor of chemical engineering at Caltech, and his postdoctoral fellow Yunk C. Yao, proposed the existence of a new chemical process that could account for its production. Giapis, along with Tom Miller, professor of chemistry, have now demonstrated a new reaction for generating oxygen that Giapis says could help humans explore the universe and perhaps even fight climate change at home. More fundamentally though, he says the reaction represents a new kind of chemistry discovered by studying comets. Most chemical reactions require energy, which is typically provided as heat. Giapis's research shows that some unusual reactions can occur by providing kinetic energy. When water molecules are shot like extremely tiny bullets onto surfaces containing oxygen, such as sand or rust, the water molecule can rip off that oxygen to produce molecular oxygen. This reaction occurs on comets when water molecules vaporize from the surface and are then accelerated by the solar wind until they crash back into the comet at high speed. Comets, however, also emit carbon dioxide CO2. Giapis and Yao wanted to test if CO2 could also produce molecular oxygen in collisions with the comet surface. When they found O2 in the stream of gases coming off the comet, they wanted to confirm that the reaction was similar to water's reaction. They designed an experiment to crash CO2 onto the inert surface of gold foil, which cannot be oxidized and should not produce molecular oxygen. Nonetheless, O2 continued to be emitted from the gold surface. This meant that both atoms of oxygen come from the same CO2 molecule, effectively splitting it in an extraordinary manner. At the time we thought it would be impossible to combine the two oxygen atoms of a CO2 molecule together because CO2 is a linear molecule, and you would have to bend the molecule severely for it to work. Giapis says. You're doing something really drastic to the molecule, to understand the mechanism of how CO2 breaks down to molecular oxygen, Giapis approached Miller and his postdoctoral fellow Philip Shushkov, who designed computer simulations of the entire process. Understanding the reaction posed a significant challenge because of the possible formation of excited molecules. These molecules have so much energy that their constituent atoms vibrate and rotate around to an enormous degree. All that motion makes simulating the reaction in a computer more difficult because the atoms within the molecules move in complex ways. In general, excited molecules can lead to unusual chemistry, so we started with that, Miller says. But, to our surprise, the excited state did not create molecular oxygen. Instead, the molecule decomposed into other products. Ultimately, we found that a severely bent CO2 can also form without exciting the molecule, and that could produce O2. The apparatus Giapis designed to perform the reaction works like a particle accelerator, turning the CO2 molecules into ions by giving them a charge and then accelerating them using an electric field, albeit at much lower energies than are found in a particle accelerator. However, he adds that such a device is not necessary for the reaction to occur. You could throw a stone with enough velocity at some CO2 and achieve the same thing, he says. It would need to be traveling about as fast as a comet or asteroid travels through space. 
That could explain the presence of small amounts of oxygen that have been observed high in the Martian atmosphere. There has been speculation that the oxygen is being generated by ultraviolet light from the sun striking CO2, but Geopis believes the oxygen is also generated by high-speed dust particles colliding with CO2 molecules. He hopes that a variation of his reactor could be used to do the same thing at more useful scales, perhaps one day serving as a source of breathable air for astronauts on Mars or being used to combat climate change by pulling CO2, a greenhouse gas, out of Earth's atmosphere and turning it into oxygen. He acknowledges, however, that both of those applications are a long way off because the current version of the reactor has a low yield, creating only 1 to 2 oxygen molecules for every 100 CO2 molecules shot through the accelerator. Is it a final device? No. Is it a device that can solve the problem with Mars? No. But it is a device that can do something that is very hard, he says. We are doing some crazy things with this reactor. The paper describing the team's findings, titled, Direct Dioxygen Evolution in Collisions of Carbon Dioxide with Surfaces, appears in the May 24 issue of Nature Communications. Caltech co-authors include Tom Miller, Professor of Chemistry, Philip Shushkov, Postdoctoral Scholar in Chemistry, and Young Si Yao, Postdoctoral Researcher, formerly of, of Caltech. Funding for the research was provided by the National Science Foundation, the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis, and the U.S. Department of Energy, 